Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today we're continuing our investigation into AMD's Ryzen Mobile 5000 APUs with a look at the Ryzen 9 5900HX, a chip that is set to be widely used across higher end gaming notebooks, supply permitting of course. While not the outright flagship processor in the lineup, that award goes to the top binned Ryzen 9 5980HX, the 5900HX should end up providing slightly better performance than the Zen 3 APUs we've looked at so far. Like other Ryzen 5000 H series chips, the Ryzen 9 5900HX features AMD's upgraded Zen 3 architecture for the CPU cores, which means a new single CCX design, double the L3 cache, and higher IPC, among other improvements. The APU is built on TSMC's 7 nanometer process, so same as last generation, however frequencies have increased slightly thanks to design optimizations. However, outside the CPU cores, there haven't been many changes to other APU features like the GPU, memory controller, and PCIe support. The 5900HX has a similar layout to other Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 9 APUs in the lineup, in that we're getting 8 CPU cores and 16 threads, 16 megabytes of L3 cache, plus 8 Vega GPU compute units unlocked, all within a 45 watt default TDP. Where the 5900HX differs compared to the 5800H is purely in clock speed. The base clock is increased by 100 MHz, indicating we should get slightly better sustained all-core frequencies at the same power level, while the boost clock has risen from 4.4 to 4.6 GHz. The GPU can now top out at 2.1 GHz as well, versus 2.0 GHz with the lower end parts. AMD also allows overclocking with this CPU, hence the HX designation, the X means overclocking apparently, although it will be up to OEMs to expose this functionality to users through their own utilities. The test system we're using for benchmarking the 5900HX today is the XMG Apex 17, an upcoming gaming laptop using a clever chassis that's almost identical to the Apex 17 we used previously to test both the Ryzen 7 5800H and NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3060 laptop GPU. The main difference here with this other Apex 17 I have on hand is purely internal components, making this a higher end configuration of the same system for those with a bit more cash to spend. So in addition to the 5900HX, we have 16GB of dual-channel DDR4-3200 memory, plus an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3070 laptop GPU running at a base 115 watts, a GPU we'll be testing soon in a variety of games. There's a 1080p 240Hz display included here as well. Other than that, it's the same mainstream style chassis we've shown off a few times now, making this a decent choice for those that want the best performance possible without breaking the bank. This configuration won't be available immediately, but I'll leave a link in the description below if you want to find out more. As always, we are testing the 5900HX Power Normalized, which allows us to compare the CPU to others found in totally different laptops in the most fair way we can currently achieve. This means the 5900HX is set to its default 45 watt long term power limit using XMG's entertainment power profile found in their included software utility. However, boost behavior remains unmodified, as is the case with all systems tested. So in this laptop, we see a sustained 54 watt boost period for several minutes. Uh, that's pretty typical of most Ryzen laptops we've reviewed so far. XMG also allows you to uncap the laptop to run at 54 watts indefinitely if you so choose. Anyway, onto the benchmarks. In Cinebench R20's multi-threaded test, the Ryzen 9 5900HX is currently the fastest mobile processor that we've tested at 45 watts. With a score of nearly 5,000 points, this CPU is 6% faster than the Ryzen 7 5800H and 15% ahead of the 4800H. What this allows Ryzen to do is extend its lead over Intel's current best H series processor, the Cryo 9 10980HK, to the point where we are now seeing a 40% performance advantage to AMD. Even when we power uncap these processors, the Ryzen 9 5900HX at 45 watts is still the fastest chip I've tested, sitting neck and neck with the Ryzen 9 5980HS also at 45 watts, which makes sense as they're very similar processors. The best score I've achieved from an Intel processor is either the Core i7-10875H running at 110 watts or the Core i9-10980HK at 75 watts, both of which score in the 4000 points range. In Cinebench R20's single-threaded test, the Ryzen 9 5900HX surprisingly scales roughly in line with the multi-thread numbers. This CPU here is 5% faster than the 5800H, and it just so happens the boost clock is 5% higher. We end up with 15% better performance here than the Core i9-10980HK, but roughly the same performance as Intel's newer Core i7-1185G7, which uses Tiger Lake cores. 
In handbrake, the Ryzen 9 5900HX does appear to be better binned, sustaining a marginally higher clock speed at 45 watts for a small performance improvement versus the 5800H. It's 7% faster in this test, achieving a 15% performance lead on the 4800H and 36% versus the 10980HK. Blender performance is nothing to get excited about. The Ryzen 9 5900HX delivers just 4% better performance than the 5800H, which itself is only slightly ahead of the 4800H. The margins compared to Intel are very similar to what we've seen previously, but upgrading from Zen 2 to Zen 3 for this workload isn't worth it in most cases. Code compilation does benefit from the 5900HX's faster boost clocks, as sections of the compile are single-threaded while others are multi-threaded. Here the Ryzen 9 part is 6% faster than the Ryzen 7 5800H, although that margin reduces to just 4% in the longer Chromium compilation. While that's not a massive difference between these parts, code compilation does show a decent performance gain over previous generation Ryzen 4000 processors. The Ryzen 9 5900HX is the fastest processor I've tested so far for MATLAB, with this benchmark benefiting significantly from the changes made to the Zen 3 architecture. Higher IPC, higher boost clocks, and more cache all help to deliver more than a 20% performance boost versus the 4800H. This makes the 5900HX 16% faster than the Core i9 10980HK. Our Microsoft Excel benchmark is heavy on the processor's cache. Here the 5900HX and 10980HK deliver effectively the same performance, with the 5900HX just a couple of percent ahead of the 5800H. However, the gains versus Zen 2 processors are more significant, and could be a good reason to upgrade your laptop after just one generation if you are a heavy Excel user. In PCMark 10's Essentials test, which measures basic application performance, the 5900HX delivers a good result at the top of the charts. This CPU is only a few percent faster than the 5800H, so practically negligible, however we do see 8% better performance than the 10980HK. Overall though, most high-end H-series laptops deliver very similar basic app performance, and things like faster uploading is probably not a strong reason to buy a new H-series device. The best result I saw for the Ryzen 9 5900HX versus the 5800H was in PCMark 10's Applications Test, which measures Microsoft Office and Edge web browsing performance. The 5900HX was 10% faster here, giving it around an 8% lead on Intel's best processor, the Core i7-1185G7. Thanks to better IPC and higher frequencies, Zen 3 is much better for Office applications than past Ryzen designs, as these workloads are lightly threaded. In 7-zip compression, the 5900HX and 5800H deliver the same performance, slightly higher than the 10980HK. The Ryzen 9 part is slightly ahead of the 5800H in decompression, but not to any groundbreaking degree, and this merely extends Ryzen's lead on Intel processors for decompression workloads. In Acrobat PDF exporting, a heavily single-threaded test, the Ryzen 9 5900HX is 4% faster than the 5800H, and around 9% ahead of the Core i9 10980HK. Despite this slight improvement over the 5800H, Intel's Core i7-1185G7 running at 28 watts remains the fastest CPU in our charts for this test, thanks to Tiger Lake clocking up to 4.8 GHz. Adobe Photoshop performance scales pretty well and closely to the single-thread performance gains we've seen previously, so there is an advantage to getting the 5900HX over the 5800H for this application, although the 5980HS with its higher boost clock is better again. With that said, the margins between each Ryzen 5000 processor are pretty small. It's really in a Zen 2 comparison where the 5900HX shines, as it's 23% faster than the 4800H. We also have Adobe Premiere's Warp Stabilizer effect running a single instance, which tends to occupy two threads at most. The 5900HX is a great choice for this workload, but again, it's only 4% faster than the 5800H. It's compared to the 10980HK, where the 5900HX shines, with a 28% performance advantage. Next up, I have some accelerated workloads, showing how the 5900HX fares in tandem with the discrete GPU here. However, there aren't many comparisons to be made here, as my 5900HX laptop uses a new RTX 3070 laptop GPU, and I haven't tested any other laptops with that GPU inside at this point. So this is purely just to demonstrate what sort of performance you can expect from a current generation high-end sort of gaming laptop. In DaVinci Resolve, the 5900HX plus RTX 3070 combination is the best that I've tested so far, beating last gen 10980HK plus RTX 2080 Super combinations. This new laptop config is actually quite a lot faster in this GPU heavy workload, 14% better than the next best option, and nearly 30% faster than your classic Max-Q style laptop. 
This combination is definitely one to look out for if you are a heavy DaVinci user, although again we don't have a comparison to an equivalent Intel configuration yet, so we don't know whether AMD is actually faster here. The 5900HX plus RTX 3070 also delivers class leading results in Puget's Adobe Premiere export test, scoring a little above the best 10980HK configurations I've tested so far. However, with that accelerated encoding, using a two-pass configuration instead for superior encode quality, we fall back to CPU performance and the 5900HX shows itself to only be slightly faster than the 5800H, which is what we've seen across many benchmarks so far. And finally, we have hardware accelerated handbrake encoding, transcoding 4K H.264 into H.265 files. In terms of AMD VCE performance, the built-in media encode decode block in Ryzen 5000 APUs, there has been no performance improvement versus the previous generation, which makes sense as AMD says this area of the chip is the same as previous generations. Generally speaking, in this test, AMD's VC is as fast at transcoding as NVIDIA's NVENC in RTX 20 and 30 series GPUs, only beaten strangely enough by the GTX 1650 Ti equipped systems that I've tested. Intel's QuickSync found in 10th gen parts is quite a lot slower in this workload. And I should note here that this benchmark uses a high enough bitrate for the Apple file that the quality is virtually identical between all encoding engine choices. This benchmark does not take into account which encoder delivers better quality at lower bit rates, which is often a use case for hardware encoding, so you'll have to check other sources to find out what is best. Last I checked, NVENC is the best, but that may have changed. This workload is purely measuring encoding speed. In this review, I'm not going to look at integrated graphics performance in depth because, quite frankly, the results are pretty boring and basically the same as what I looked at in my 5800H review. So if you are curious about how the iGPU performs, check that review. I'd expect that almost all 5900HX systems will feature a discrete GPU anyway, making the results not that valuable for most laptop buyers. Comparing the Ryzen 9 5900HX to the Ryzen 7 5800H shows that the 5900HX is only a few percent faster for the most part, whether we're talking about single or multi-threaded applications. On average, the 5900HX is 4% faster across these benchmarks shown here, which is pretty close to the difference in clock speeds between the processors. The 5900HX does appear to be better binned, allowing it to hit high boost frequencies and better sustained frequencies at 45 watts. But given the two parts of both 8 cores with 16 threads, that's really all there is to it in terms of differences. While not a true class versus class comparison, the Ryzen 9 5900HX is quite a bit faster than the Ryzen 7 4800H. Previously, when comparing the 5800H to 4800H, the multi-thread gains were quite modest, but with the 5900HX being a few percent faster, that helps extend the lead on the 4800H. If you are upgrading across just one generation like this, you can expect 15% better multi-thread performance and 20-25% to better single-thread performance, which is pretty great. The Ryzen 9 5900HX is almost always faster than the Core i9 10980HK. In fact, I'd say that at the least, these two processors are equal, and at best, the 5900HX is 40% faster when CPU limited. The big strength for the 5900HX is multi-thread performance, where the efficiency of the 7nm node allows the Ryzen processor to pull well ahead of Intel's aging 14nm process. Single thread is closer, but generally the new Zen 3 design clocked up to 4.6GHz is able to edge out a small win. Ignoring multi-thread here, which isn't really relevant, the Ryzen 9 5900HX delivers very similar performance to Intel's Core i7-1185G7 in single-threaded apps. The 1185G7 uses Intel's new Tiger Lake cores on their 10 nanometer Superfin process, and there's not much separating these parts core for core. When Intel is able to deliver 8-core Tiger Lake mobile processors in a few months, the battle could be quite interesting. When it comes to summing up what the Ryzen 9 5900HX offers, there's really two ways to look at it. On the one hand, this mobile processor is the fastest that we've seen yet, delivering excellent performance across the board. On the other hand, the 5900HX isn't that much faster than the Ryzen 7 5800H, so depending on the laptop configuration, it may not be the best choice. If you focus on the positives to begin with, the 5900HX delivers everything we've talked about in previous Ryzen Mobile 5000 reviews. Chart-topping performance, 
and thanks to new Zen 3 architectures, much improved single thread performance and IPC relative to previous Ryzen processors. This allows the 5900HX to beat Intel's Core i9 10980HK in the vast majority of applications, especially when those apps make heavy use of multi-threading while trading blows with Intel's newer Tiger Lake designs in single threaded tests. Given both single and multi-threading is a strength of the 5900HX, it's a great all-round mobile processor that should be up to any task that you throw at it. However, the Ryzen 9 5900HX is just 4% faster than the Ryzen 7 5800H on average, as both chips are fundamentally very similar. It's a pretty consistent 4% or thereabouts across the board too, with no margin higher than 10%. So in my opinion, it's not worth paying much of a price premium to get a 5900HX laptop over something with the 5800H inside, unless the 5900HX system comes with additional benefits like a, say, a faster GPU, for example. The 5800H simply provides most of the performance that you get with the 5900HX. This information I suspect will be most useful for people buying, say, an RTX 3070 laptop that have the choice between a 5800H laptop from brand A and 5900HX from brand B. Unless you desperately want single digit gains, get whatever option is cheaper or has the best set of features outside of the CPU. With that said, I wouldn't really be considering an Intel 10th gen laptop at this point. The performance just isn't there relative to Ryzen. So unless an Intel machine was a decent amount cheaper, I don't think it would be worth buying. If you're interested in Intel laptops and want to get a better scope of the competition, it could be worth waiting a couple of months until 11th gen Tiger Lake gaming systems with 8 cores are ready for prime time. Anyway, that's it for this review of the Ryzen 9 5900HX. We do have a few other laptop related content to get through in the rest of this month, so stay tuned for that. As always, if you're interested in supporting the channel and the testing that we do here, uh, you can sign up to our Floatplane or Patreon pages. Links to that are in the description below. If you sign up to Floatplane, you will get early access to some of our videos and Across both of those platforms, you will get access to Discord chat, monthly live streams, all the usual good stuff. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.